Hello, our project is called Constitution Annotated Supreme Court Justices. My name is Sonia Kelly and I'm from Irvine, California. I'm an undergraduate at the College of William and Mary and the University of St. Andrews majoring in history. This summer, I'm a junior fellow in the American Law Division of the Congressional Research Service at the Library of Congress, writing biographies of United States Supreme Court Justices for the Constitution Annotated. The Constitution Annotated is a century old comprehensive official record of how the Supreme Court has interpreted the, U the US Constitution and includes annotations on every article and amendment to the Constitution, as well as introductory and supplementary annotations. My biography is of James Wilson, one of Washington's appointees to the first Supreme Court. James Wilson spent the first 23 years of his life in Scotland at the height of the Scottish Enlightenment and attended the University of St. Andrews about 250 years before I did. He also attended the University of Glasgow and possibly the University of Edinburgh before traveling to the colonies in 1765. When Wilson arrived in the colonies, he worked as a tutor at the College of Philadelphia, receiving an honorary degree in 1766 because of his proficiency in classical languages. He studied law under John Dickinson, opened his own practices in Carlisle, Reading, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Annapolis, Maryland, and became one of the most well-known lawyers in the colonies. He was an influential delegate at the Continental Congress and the Constitutional Convention, particularly as a member of the Committee of Detail, a five-person committee that wrote the first full drafts of the Constitution. The Supreme Court heard fewer than 10 cases during Wilson's tenure because the justices spent much of their time holding circuit courts. Nonetheless, Wilson's legal philosophy is illuminated by the opinions he wrote, as well as the many law lectures he delivered as the first professor of law at the University of Pennsylvania. Alongside his deep understanding of American law, Wilson had a unique grounding in Scottish and French law because of his Scottish background and his role as advocate general for France and the colonies in 1780. His opinions on the Supreme Court reflect the continental European legal tradition, which is grounded in civil law rather than English common law, with Wilson typically relying on general legal principles before turning to previous case law. He served on the Supreme Court until his death in 1798, but his law lectures would come to shape some of the most influential Supreme Court cases in American history, including Marbury v. Madison and McCulloch v. Maryland. With this project, I hope to help readers of the Constitution Annotated understand the lives of these justices and how their personal stories influence their interpretation of the Constitution and the shaping of our country. Hello, my name is Shannon Summers. I am from Brooklyn, New York, and I am an undergraduate student at Yale University majoring in political science and history. This summer, I worked on the Supreme Court Justice Project for the American Law Division of the Congressional Research Service, writing biographies of former justices for the online Constitution Annotated. I conducted in-depth research on Justice John Rutledge, who, despite being the Supreme Court's second chief justice, is largely forgotten to American history. This is due primarily to the fact that Justice Rutledge's tenure as chief lasted only 138 days, the shortest term ever for a chief justice. He was also the first Supreme Court nominee not to be subsequently confirmed by the Senate. Through writing this biography of Rutledge, I have sought to combine primary and secondary sources to create a detailed illustration of his contributions to American government and law while also examining what Rutledge's truncated time on the court reveals about the politics of Supreme Court nominations in the early Republic. Although Rutledge served on the Supreme Court only briefly, my research reveals political and legal lessons from his experience that are pertinent to our understanding of the court today. Rutledge was a highly esteemed figure in colonial governance by the time Washington nominated him to be an associate justice on the first Supreme Court. He was a governor of his home state of South Carolina during the American Revolutionary War, head of the South Carolina delegation to the Constitutional Convention, and responsible for several fundamental components of the US Constitution, including the Supremacy Clause. Rutledge left the Supreme Court after his first appointment as an Associate Justice to serve on the judiciary of South Carolina. He then returned to the Supreme Court after President Washington offered him the position of Chief Justice through a recess appointment. In Justice Rutledge's short tenure as chief, he heard two cases regarding the United States' role on the international stage and the power of the judiciary to address questions of foreign relations. In addition to examining the legal consequences of those two cases, 
the Library of Congress's resources allow me to explore why the Senate declined to confirm Rutledge as chief. Right before receiving word of his nomination as chief justice, Rutledge made a speech railing against what he saw as significant concessions by the US to Great Britain in the Jay Treaty, which aimed to settle unresolved post-war issues between the two countries. Rutledge went so far as to state that he would rather see Washington dead than watch a treaty come to fruition. In so doing, Rutledge violated previously unarticulated norms of judicial conduct. The inflammatory nature of Rutledge's remarks led to infuriated correspondence among significant political figures, including senators who debated whether the speech was severe enough not to confirm him. Moreover, the partisan press played a significant role in determining the course of Rutledge's nomination. Democratic, Republican, and Federalist newspapers portrayed his speech quite differently. In the end, the Senate split along party lines to reject his nomination. The Library of Congress's incredible primary source documents provided a window into the saga. From this picture of the tally sheet recording the Senate's vote on Rutledge's nomination as chief to Rutledge and Washington's correspondence, these materials enabled me to see firsthand how Rutledge's fate unfolded, and I came to better understand the political context than informed court history. I've had a great time completing this project, and I'm honored to have been a junior fellow. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sarah Roundsville, and I'm from Rio Rancho, New Mexico. I'm a graduate student at the University of Notre Dame, where I am beginning my PhD in American history. This summer, I worked in the American Law Division of the Congressional Research Service on the Constitution Annotated Supreme Court Biographies Project. I am researching John Jay, the first Chief Justice of the United States. John Jay brought decades of experience as a lawyer, statesman, and diplomat to the Supreme Court. Born in 1745 to a prominent merchant family in New York, John Jay worked as a successful lawyer before joining colonial protests against British policies. Although initially in favor of reconciliation with Great Britain, Jay's experiences as a delegate to the First and Second Continental Congresses, as well as the outbreak of war, cemented his support for American independence. After his time with the Continental Congress, Jay served for several years as Minister Plenipotentiary to Spain. In 1782, Jay went to France to help negotiate the end of the war. There he became one of the chief negotiators of the Treaty of Paris of 1783. Upon returning to the United States, Jay continued his diplomatic and political work as Secretary of Foreign Affairs from 1784 to 1789. However, he expressed frustration with the limited power and effectiveness of the government under the Articles of Confederation. Becoming a prominent advocate of strong centralized government, Jay supported the new constitution as one of the authors of the Federalist Papers. In 1789, Jay accepted President Washington's nomination to be the first Chief Justice of the United States. Jay presided over the Supreme Court's for formative first years during which the justices established many of the court's customs and procedures. The Jay Court heard relatively few cases, the most significant being Chisholm v. Georgia in 1793. Jay joined the majority in rejecting Georgia's claim of state sovereign immunity from suits in federal court, a decision later overturned by the 11th Amendment to the Constitution. Throughout his time as Chief Justice, Jay repeatedly stressed his belief in the necessity of a strong, dignified, and independent judiciary to ensure the power and balance of the federal government. In 1795, while still serving as Chief Justice, John Jay went to London to negotiate the controversial Jay Treaty with Great Britain, which addressed many outstanding post-war issues and maintains the peace between the two nations. When Jay returned, he resigned his position as Chief Justice to become Governor of New York, where he served from 1795 to 1801. After his tenure as governor, Jay declined nomination to return to the Supreme Court and retired from politics until his death in 1829. Thank you.